Hi, this is David Liu from Facebook Audio Video Understanding Team. Together with my colleague Priyam Chatterjee, we will present our work in Smart Crop and Smart Preview using in-stream video understanding. We will first explain what is in-stream video understanding. Next, we will dive deeper into two use cases. One is Smart Crop and one is Smart Preview. Understanding video content has been a focus for video sharing platforms. It is one of the most important driving forces for the growth in distribution, discovery, user experience, and monetization. In-stream video understanding is the technology area where we analyze and utilize finer granularity video signals in the spatial and the temporal domains. These are machine learning models trained on a large number of images and videos. The fine-grained spatial and temporal signals can be used for consumer-facing products or used as signals for downstream models and pipelines. For example, in the spatial domain, we identify the salient regions inside each frame, which enables the system to automatically reframe a horizontal video into a vertical one. The system can automatically change the aspect ratio of your videos from 16 by 9 horizontal video to either 1 by 1 or 4 by 5, which is important for sharing videos in platforms using a vertical format such as Facebook's feed. In the temporal domain, here are several use cases of in-stream video understanding. In the first one on the top, the system identifies the highlight score of each frame, which can be used to identify the highlight moments inside a video and create a video trailer or preview. Such signal could potentially also be used for inserting advertisements at the right moment, which is shown in the second figure. In the third row, in-stream video understanding can help us identify timestamps for breaking a longer video into shorter chapters, which is useful for nonlinear watching. In the bottom, in-stream video understanding can help us summarize video transcripts into different forms of text, which could potentially enable different ways of publishing. Next, we will dive deeper into the smart cropping system, a system that is based on in-stream video understanding in the spatial domain. We recently announced a feature inside Creator Studio called Smart Crop. Smart Crop can automatically change the aspect ratios of your videos from 16 by 9 horizontal to either 1 by 1 or 4 by 5. As a best practice, we recommend using 4 by 5 or 1 by 1 aspect ratio in Facebook's feed. This feature optimizes for the main subject in the content, keeping the main subjects centered and in frame. You will be able to publish this video directly within Creator Studio, and you can review the reframed video prior to publishing. You can also compare the reframed version with the original video prior to publishing in order to decide which version you would like to publish. It takes a lot of work to edit multiple sizing variations across platforms. With Smart Crop, you can automatically edit your videos for the sizes you need. Using Smart Crop allows content producers to save time when reframing the sizes of their videos manually, hence reducing the amount of work it takes to optimize videos. Every day, Thousands of videos are processed through Smart Crop. Let's look at this video. On the left, 
is the 16 by 9 source video. In the middle is the predicted saliency map, also known as the attention distribution. On the right is the 9 by 16 result. The saliency map describes the probability of where an average person would first look at the image. It is generally related to high contrast areas in the spatial, temporal, and frequency domains, and is sometimes also correlated with high-level features, such as people's faces, hands, and interesting objects in the scene. It is a convolutional neural network that is trained to predict image and video saliency. We have experimented with both RGB only and RGB plus motion as input. The results shown here are based on RGB only. After the saliency map is predicted, we need to place a window to determine where to crop the image. In this example, if we were to optimize for the maximum amount of saliency placed within a window, we would choose the window shown on the top. When the saliency map has low confidence in its predictions, then we would just place the window at the center. In other words, usually we favor salient regions, but sometimes we would default back to the center position when we have low confidence in the saliency map. The window location is where we have the highest one-dimensional saliency density, max aggregated, and weighted either uniformly or with a truncated Gaussian to favor placing saliency objects in the middle of the frame. The result from the previous step tends to jump or jitter in time. To avoid visually unpleasant results, we apply some filtering, which changes the jitter to smooth panning, resulting in a more professional look and feel. If we were to strictly follow the saliency map's central location all the time, there would be unpleasant jittering during scene changes or when there is abrupt motion, because the saliency map would then change heavily within a short period of time. We have tried different rules to track the moving focal points, which are the local maxima of the saliency map. And we have tried different heuristics to handle multiple focal points in the scene. We observed that simple median filtering and using linear panning that is lagging in time already generates quite natural results and masks various imperfections and performs similar to how a human would handle the camera motion and zoom. We allow zooming out with letterboxing as some videos have frame-wide text or other overlaid graphics. It is actually better to keep those text or graphics at the cost of having letterboxing. We use the saliency map to determine when to zoom out. Unfortunately, the saliency map sometimes does not have high enough score across the entire text, resulting in text that is cropped, which looks unpleasant. To solve this problem, we use text detection technology. As shown in this example, text detection gives strong response, which allows us to avoid cropping the text and provide a better user experience. Before we move on to the second part of this presentation, let us conclude this part with a quick demonstration. On the left is the original video. In the middle is the saliency map. The yellow window is determined from the saliency map. You can see how the window sizes changes according to the pattern in the saliency map. It zooms in and out dynamically in order to change and capture the most important content. Next, my colleague Priyam Chatterjee will introduce our video highlight technology, which empowers 
the smart preview system in Creator Studio. Thank you, David. We talked about how we use spatial saliency along with temporal information to do video cropping. Now we pivot to another spatial temporal application, creating highlights for a video. People come to Facebook to enjoy content. Users prefer to watch contextually relevant content. However, even within relevant videos, not all videos or segments of videos are equally interesting. Entertaining content typically garners more watch time while also improving users' experience. With this work stream, we aim to understand which regions of a video are likely to be interesting or less interesting and use these signals to improve both content producers and user experiences. One such application is to create previews highlighting the interesting regions. This helps provide a sneak peek into the video's most engaging regions and can help users determine whether a video is likely to be enjoyable to them, even if specific parts of the video may not be so. We can also use the interestingness signal to help content producers make their content more engaging by removing parts that don't contribute meaningfully to the whole video. This can help them edit their videos to capture user attention better. Our system can be used to generate multiple kinds of previews based on their intention and target destination. Here, we show a few examples of different forms of previews. For example, the first longer preview contents a single segment of the video and includes audio and can be used as a trailer for a video. If it's going to help with food and farming, should it learn from programmers and engineers or also from farmers? We believe AI should reflect all of us. On the other hand, shorter form versions can provide a quick peek into the video. Such an experience may not need audio and may need to sample from multiple regions of a video. Our work is now integrated into Creator Studio, which is Facebook's video publishing workflow, where we provide the option for content producers to prepend an engaging preview to their videos. This is often used by high-end content producers who have considerable video editing experience. Our work aims to democratize this process to more content producers and reduce the friction of producing engaging content on Facebook. Content producers have the choice to review and refine the suggestion before publishing. When there is enough trust gathered, they can choose to automatically publish with the predicted preview as well. Now, we go under the hood to talk a bit more about the tech powering this experience. Our preview generation process consists of three parts. Highlight score generation, a post-processing step, and finally, the clip generation step. The highlight score generation is a deep learning model that ingests low-level signals from the audio and video streams and predicts an interestingness score for every two seconds of the video. The post-pricing step uses these scores to identify regions to select based on the target duration and fine-tunes the start and end regions to avoid abrupt start and stop regions. And the final step is to create the new clip with various effects depending on the surface. Example effects include fade-outs, looping, transition through black frames, etc. The idea being, to clearly demarcate where the preview ends and the main video begins. But to train the model, we first need data. We want our model to be as closely aligned as possible to the content we will process and our end goal, that is, to make content more engaging to users. This means training with public data sets such as movie trailers is probably not as useful since videos on Facebook are significantly different in format. 
The other option is to annotate data ourselves. But this is a highly subjective process and also time consuming. Instead, we take a semi-supervised approach to the problem. We capture data at scale by looking at different signals for videos on Facebook. For example, we could look at scrubbing information. The hypothesis being that at scale, more users probably scrub to an interesting region and away from a less interesting region. This data, however, is quite noisy. We can alternately choose to collect data from editing workflows that content producers use to trim their content before publishing to Facebook. The hypothesis here being that given a time budget, content producers choose to prioritize retention of important or interesting regions while trimming out less interesting content from the video. This is unfortunately not at the same scale as the scrub data that I talked about, but this represents a content producer-centric view of what's interesting in a video. The above two approaches allow us to still train a model to make some initial predictions about interesting regions in a video. But the question is, can we do better? The answer lies in an active learning framework. We can use the initial model's prediction and run A-B tests to see how a modified video published with a short preview performs in terms of watch time compared to the original video. Whenever the model performs worse, we obtain hard examples. This process allows us to a healthy trade-off of gathering training data at scale with good enough quality. Moreover, this is directly aligned with our goal that is to help content producers engage with their target audience better. Our model predicts an interesting score for every two seconds of the video. We find this granularity provides a good trade-off of noise sensitivity and temporal resolution. We use an in-house multimodal video classification model to generate the clip embeddings for every two seconds of the video. However, this could be any video classification model. A set of these embeddings are then fed into the highlights prediction model. The model head or highlights prediction model consists of a convolutional neural network that aggregates the multiple embeddings to a single embedding. This is followed by a shallow, fully connected network to predict the final score. We keep the weights from the classification trunk frozen when training the highlights prediction task. To train our model, we use a Siamese network with a ranking loss. Embeddings from the classification trunk for the more interesting regions of a video are provided to one tower, while those from the less interesting regions of the video are provided to the other tower. The model is then trained to produce a higher score for the more interesting clips. This ML model provides a decent prediction of the interestingness of a video. However, this score cannot be used as is, especially when longer form previews are desired. For this, we add a post-pricing step to filter and select the more interesting regions of the video. We also check speech and short boundaries to make the start and end regions less abrupt. However, this may not always be possible given the target duration of the preview. So we cast the post-pricing step as an optimization problem where we want to obtain a pair of start and end timestamps that maximize a cost function. Our cost function uses a goodness of start and stop regions uh, which takes into account a measure of how far the stop and start regions are from speech boundaries, what the audio amplitudes are at those regions, and we also take into account what the average highlight score is contained in the region that we select, and finally, how close the selected clip is to the desired preview duration. We add weights to each of these constraints based on some empirical tunings that we did to obtain the final proposed highlights. Note here that we can do this not only for a single region of the video, but can also extend this to multiple regions. We can employ a greedy approach for that, 
but more sophisticated approaches can definitely be used to produce better results. Until now, we have talked mostly about the core technology, but a big part of the success of this project lies in how efficiently we can scale this to different use cases within Facebook. Here, we dive a bit into the technical aspects of the infrastructure of our highlights platform. Our platform needs to support multiple different effect generations. Example, long form previews that include audio and possibly allow user intervention. Also, short form previews that may be a sequence of multiple interesting regions served without audio. Additionally, there may be fade out effects, etc., that are also added. Another thing to keep in mind is that while a generic model that we discussed earlier can be a catch all, models that target specific verticals are typically better at predicting interesting regions. For example, the approach one may take to detect highlights for a music video may be totally different to one taken for, say, cooking videos. We developed our infrastructure with the ability to channel highlight score from different models as well. At a high level, our system design looks like this. At the lowest level, we have the various signals generated for each segment of a video. These are then used as inputs to various models. In some cases, we can infer the class of videos based on content producer provided tags, video classification model prediction, theme of content producers, etc. We can use this information to channel the video to any specific models that may be best suited for its vertical, with the generic model being a default. This is the video highlight signal layer. Finally, we have the client-facing API where clients can either read the raw scores or ask for highlight segment information after post-processing or maybe directly ask for the video preview itself. One of the other aspects of our infrastructural design is being efficient with resources. We follow the concept of three R's, that is reduce, reuse, and recycle. Scores, metadata, and previews are generated on first request and cached for consequent use by different clients. We also remain agile to client needs for different preview effects, as we showed earlier, by reusing as much common resources as possible. Most new effects, therefore, end up being configuration changes and just a few lines of integration code. While we see interesting use cases with this work, we think there is so much more to do. One direction is along the line of dedicated models. Research and our initial exploration on a few specific topics point to the fact that more targeted models typically perform better than a one model fits all approach. We aim to identify specific verticals where the generic model does not seem to be performing well and see if developing dedicated models makes sense. There is also some exploration for different types of previews based on the word video vertical. And even for the generic model, we plan to explore more recent advances in video understanding and classification techniques to continually improve our predictions. Much of the work we presented here was possible due to multiple people. We want to specifically mention Yuri, Guangxiao, and Lifei among other colleagues and partners within Facebook who made this work possible. And thank you so much for attending this talk. Thanks. Hey everyone, we're back for the Q&A session and I'm joined here with David and Priyam. Hi David, hi Priyam. Hey. Great talk there, a uh, good change of pace from all this talking about live streaming and now we're getting more into the machine learning side and video understanding. So it is really cool to uh, learn some of that stuff there. Um, yeah, without further ado, let me start with the first question here from Tim in the audience. 
So how do we go about helping creators understand the viewing experience on different devices as we are doing things like dynamic cropping and editing? Yeah, let, let me try to take this one. I think this is a great question. This is really a question that touches the heart of, of this uh, product and research. So um, the way I think about it is um, 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 to, 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 I want to discuss this in two directions, right? So when the AI or ML is making some mistakes, right? That's one case. And the other one is when it's actually in nature, it's an ambiguous situation. And we, even the human, we don't know what is the, the right thing to do, right? So, so let me talk about the first one. So in terms of errors, right? Let's talk about the smart crop. So the smart crop, it starts with a wide landscape video and the, the AI uh, tries to find the, the right place to crop, right? And uh, if I think about errors, one, one obvious situation is if, if I'm talking, right? And if I'm the, the main character in that video frame, uh, then obviously if I crop right in the middle of the face, crop out part of the face, then it's probably not right, right? And um, this is one, one example. So I think these examples, and now to answer the question, right? This, these type of scenarios, um, the, the creator actually can uh, catch this type of errors uh, prior to publishing, right? Because in, in uh, Creator Studio, which is our editing tool, um, the creator is given the, um, the, the, the UI to review the cropped version. So he or she should be easily um, spot these type of errors. Now, the, the other uh, more uh, challenging situation is when, um, when even a human may not know where is the best place to crop, right? Or if you think of a smart photographer, should he or she, should a photographer now look at this part of the video frame or that part, right? Um, I think that's sometimes ambiguous. For example, if there are two people talking to each other and they are standing quite far apart, right? So imagine you have a wide video frame. One person is on the very far left. One person is on the very far right, right? Then I would imagine um, different photographers would have different opinions, right? If uh, I, I may say, hey, I want everybody in the frame, right? So I will zoom out as much as possible and the viewer can see both people talking. But another photographer may say, hey, I want to zoom in onto uh, the person who is speaking and ignore the other person, right? And as soon as the other person starts talking, I will shift the camera angle to look at that person. So here, I think there, there is ambiguity by nature and we cannot always expect uh, AI to do the exact thing that the human uh, expects. So again, that's why in uh, Creator Studio, we offer uh, the creator uh, the, the opportunity to, to examine the result. Um, and he, if he doesn't like it, then he has a choice to not use the, the, the cropped video. So that would be my response here. Hope that was helpful. No, that makes total sense. So allowing them to see the preview just to kind of human audit it before pushing it out there to all their followers and audience. That makes total sense. Um, this one just came in from Surab. Um, are any of the video classification models that we use open source? Wow, this is a very good question. So um, in today's talk, we, we only talked about two very specific um, um, products, right? One is smart crop, one is smart preview. I, I think this question seems to be a little bit more general. Maybe this is touching upon uh, Facebook or now Meta whether uh, our classification models are open source. As far as I know, uh, Meta or Facebook, we're uh, open sourcing a lot of our uh, computer vision, AI, NLP research. You probably have heard of PyTorch, right? That's a great uh, open source framework for training uh, all sorts of AI uh, models, right? And uh, many of these uh, models that have been trained on uh, PyTorch they are also uh, open sourced. And um, also there are, I don't know, thousands or what's the number of uh, researchers around the world 
that are using uh, uh, PyTorch day-to-day uh, -day in their research, they are publishing their models uh, very often as well. So I hope that kind of answers the question. Okay. I want to touch a little bit on these, like the generic classification models that we use for the video highlights work, at least uh, the model itself is not uh, open source, but the classification work is based on multiple publications that Facebook or now Meta has done on the video classification literature. Uh, and as I mentioned in the talk itself, uh, that these are like replaceable, we just use it for uh, productionalizing in-house because it has certain advantages, but we should be able to do plug and play and retrain the model with any other classification networks as well. All right, makes sense. And David, I think you can rest assured that there's definitely more than thousands of people using PyTorch in the industry. Um, next question, um, how were the interestingness scores, which is what you mentioned you used in the cropping, um, calibrated to human feedback. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm guessing this is more related to the highlights work. Uh, so in terms of, uh, this is a good question because the short answer to this is the model right now is not calibrated because it's trained as a pairwise ranking model. Uh, essentially what we are trying to find out is given a video, where are the more interesting regions and where are the less engaging regions? We are not trying to assign a specific score in terms of what's the level of interestingness it's all relative specific to this uh, particular to a particular video in that sense but it does but there may be other applications where we may want to look at uh, whether a calibrated score makes sense and there is definitely some thought that's needed to get this uh, done one of the ways i can think of is essentially looking at the metric gap right now we are just making it up uh, more interesting and less interesting but we could definitely assign scores in some normalized way based on whether a particular video gets uh, like stronger uh, stronger engagement compared to another uh, based on the highlights that we uh, surface as a pre as a preview, excuse me. So this is still an open question in chat. Yeah. Got it, got it. That makes sense. Um, okay, following up. Um, what mathematical models of image and video statistics are being used to study the vast possibilities of content when operating at scale? Yeah, let me try this one. Um, I, I think this is a great question. and. Um, it, um, uh, you're absolutely right. The, there are just these um, enormous a number of different possibilities of content that deserves um, understanding, right? So if I think from two different angles, one is from the uh, technology point of view, right? Uh, you asked about uh, mathematical models and image and video statistics. I think from a technology point of view, uh, computer vision, NLP, um, deep learning, these have uh, become very um, uh, popular and democratized nowadays. And um, what uh, uh, can be done here is uh, a little bit beyond building uh, mathematical models or, or analyzing image and video statistics, uh, right? If I think in terms of the history of how AI has evolved in the last 10 years. Um, uh, it really went from a, a stage where you required um, uh, some mathematical background and you do uh, feature engineering to build uh, machine learning models. It has evolved into a stage where uh, in the deep learning era, right, you collect uh, a good amount of data, you have good quality of annotations, and then the neural network, it does a lot of the, uh, the, the job for you, right? So, um, so my, my short answer here is from a technology point of view, I think there, there, is, there are much more, uh, many, many more uh, angles to approach this uh, video understanding problem beyond mathematical models or image and video statistics. 
Now, uh, my second point here is from, from a use case point of view, um, we, we are uh, here thinking very often about um, how to bring the, the right content to uh, the right users. And at the same time, we want to make the producers, uh, the creators successful, right? So with very concrete use cases in mind, then uh, we uh, then think about what are the most relevant technology uh, we can leverage to enable those use cases. Um, so, and, to, and to touch a little bit on those, right? So the core methods of classification uh, that we use for most of these other works that we talked about are mathematically sound. They're, as I mentioned, they're published in papers, etc. But out here, we are doing an intersection of art and science in the sense because these are things that uh, people with strong publishing background and publishing houses, they will do manually in trying to create the best view either spatially or temporally. And we are trying to get ML to mimic that background. So it kind of deviates from that mathematical model somewhat. And the at scale part is we can look at a large number of uh, videos and see where we are doing well, where we are not, and let the models learn from that behavior in that sense. That makes total sense. Getting the art and science blending is a great analogy just because like, unlike natural language processing, when you know what is being said at the end of the day as a human listener, smart cropping and video understanding is a little bit more subjective. So yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, this one's a bit open-ended. I think this might be the last one we have time for, unfortunately. And it's to both of you. As what do you see the future of video understanding looking like in the long term? For example, what technologies or approaches do you predict that we might have? I see. Yeah, let, let me give it a try. I think this is a, a very broad question, and this um, this is a great question again. So I think uh, the 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 future here is about uh, really a deeper understanding of the content, right? So uh, in our presentation on the smart crop system, right? I think uh, what the system may be trying to learn is where uh, an average human would look at when he sees a big video frame, right? So where the attention should go to. That does require some understanding of the content, but that's a very specific one, like where the attention should go to, right? But in terms of the field of video understanding, it's, it's much, much, uh, broader and deeper than that. So I um, think one thing is um, uh, nowadays the, the computer vision researchers and the uh, natural language researchers, sometimes they are still two different, uh, these are two different areas, but in terms of video understanding, this is where these two camps really meet each other because sometimes uh, from a human point of view, the information is coming from the video from the pixels, right? And sometimes it's coming from the sound, from the audio, from the, from the language. So video understanding here is the, the wonderful venue where these two camps meet each other and try to bring the best possible um, uh, experiences to, to our users. Awesome. Um, and if Priyam, if you didn't have anything else to add there, yeah, well, the only thing I meant, uh, can add on this, as David mentioned, is there's a, like, there's a lot of ground to be made from how humans perceive a video versus how uh, computers or AI does that right now. And then again, there is this objective nature of, is this video of a ball game uh, to whether this is framed right in a way which is the subjective or the artistic part. So there are many different directions to pursue. I know this is a little vague in that sense, but I think we're just starting to scratch the surfaces in what AI is capable of doing. Totally. Well, that's all the time we have, unfortunately. I think there are still a few we didn't get to. Sorry about that for those who asked them. Um, but David and Priyam, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for your great answers to the Q&A as well. Thank you, Adash, for having us. Absolutely. And then keeping on the theme of video understanding, up next we have Andrew from Microsoft. He'll be talking about synthetic media and the content provenance challenges that come associated with that. 